There we go. Right, so today we want to look at the lymphatic system. Lymphatic system. The lymphatic system. And the best place to start the lymphatic system is to think about the capillaries that we're already familiar with. So do you remember we've got capillaries, and the capillaries are made up of vascular endothelial cells in narrow tubes. Here we have a capillary, just in the tissues of the body. It could be in your thumb, it could be anywhere. There's a capillary. All with their own individual nuclei. They are individual cells. And as we know, the blood goes through the capillaries. There's some red cells going through. Capillaries are very narrow, so very often the red cells only go through one at a time. And we know that the red cells are darker and on the outside lighter on the inside because they're biconcaved discs and then we know that the blood leaves via the venous end of the capillary We also know that capillaries perfuse tissues with blood, and a tissue is a group of similar cells. So there's going to be tissue cells here, that are perfused by this capillary. Now when the blood comes into this end of the capillary, it's come from an arteriole. So the blood here is at relatively high pressure, about 32 millimetres of mercury. So the blood is coming in to the arterial end of the capillary at reasonably high pressure. And by the time it leaves to drain into a venule, that's down to about 12 millimetres of mercury pressure. And you might remember that in the plasma there are large protein molecules, plasma proteins, large molecules. And these large molecules are osmotic they are protein molecules and they are osmotic. That means they're going to attract water. And the pressure of these plasma protein molecules is about 25 millimetres of mercury. So what this means, at the arterial end of the capillary, there's 32 millimetres of pressure pushing out, but only 25 sucking back in. So because there's more pushing out than sucking back in, that means water is going to be pushed out from the intravascular compartment through into this compartment here, the tissue fluid compartment, or the interstitial compartment. So fluid is going to collect in this interstitial compartment. That's very good because that bathes all of the tissue cells and it is the essential medium through which diffusion of gases and nutrients and waste products is going to take place. So it's good that this happens. And actually, throughout the body, if you take the body as a whole, about 30 litres, 
about 30 litres of this tissue fluid is formed every day. So every day throughout the body we're forming about 30 litres of interstitial fluid. It's good because we need to bathe the cells in water. It is the living matrix. Water is the diffusional medium. It is essential. But can you see if we're producing 30 litres of tissue fluid a day, by tea time we'd be getting a bit soggy, wouldn't we? We'd be sloshing around with tissue fluid and we'd all be grossly edematous. But fortunately, the osmotic pressure generated by the plasma proteins is in the intravascular compartment. And by the time we get towards the venous end of the capillary, the osmotic pressure, which is about 25 millimetres of mercury, is now much higher than the pressure inside the blood vessel, the hydrostatic pressure, which is now down to about 12 millimetres of mercury. So can you see now the osmotic pressure sucking the water back in exceeds the blood pressure, exceeds the hydrostatic pressure inside, so the water is going to go back in. So the tissue fluid is formed here because the blood pressure is greater than the osmotic pressure, but it's reabsorbed here because the osmotic pressure is now greater than the blood pressure. So the tissue fluid goes back in. So what this means is we have a microcirculation of tissue fluid. So here the blood pressure is pushing the water out, here the osmotic pressure is sucking it back in. And the osmotic pressure is generated primarily by the plasma proteins. So if you think about our osmosis, osmosis is movement of water from a watery area to a less watery area. That's what osmosis is, from a watery area to a less watery area. And because the plasma contains lots of plasma proteins, taking up space, that makes that a less watery area. <coughs> Whereas the fluid in the interstitial compartment is more watery because it contains many less, contains a lot less protein. So we've got movement of water from a watery area here to a less watery area in the intravascular compartment in the blood vessels. That's the direction of the osmotic flow. And that flow amounts to a suction pressure of 25 millimetres of mercury. So can you see all this physiology depends on the presence of the plasma proteins in the intravascular compartment. Does that make sense? If there weren't the plasma proteins in the blood, then there'd be nothing to suck the water back into the blood, into the, inter into the intravascular compartment, back into the capillaries. We have to have the plasma proteins. Without the plasma proteins, we haven't got the osmotic suction effect. <coughs> We have to have the plasma proteins. And we have to have the plasma proteins here, but we don't want the plasma proteins on this side of the membrane. We have to have them inside. Now, we've mentioned that there's about 30 litres of tissue fluid formed per day. The vast majority of that, about 90% of that, goes back in to the capillaries. <coughs> It goes back into the capillaries. But can you see that still leaves three litres a day of tissue fluid which is formed that is not osmotically moved back into the venous end of the capillaries. And three litres a day is quite a lot, isn't it? So three litres, about three litres of this 30 litres is not reabsorbed, it's left in the tissue spaces. And we need to get rid of that. 
So can you see we need some additional sort of drainage system? If you field all your gardens too wet, you've got to put some drainage in, haven't you? To drain the water out. And it's exactly the same with the tissues of the body. We need an additional drainage system to get rid of this excess water that's left in the tissue spaces. And also, as well as having some excess water in the tissue spaces, what sometimes happens is some of these plasma proteins escape. Some of the plasma proteins escape. They're not really supposed to, but some of them do. Some of the plasma proteins escape from the plasma and get into the tissue fluids. Now this is a real problem because can you see the more plasma protein we have in the tissue fluid the more osmotic the tissue fluid will become. Is that logical? Because it's the plasma proteins that are generating the osmotic suction. So if we end up with osmotic suction here can you see we're going to accumulate even more water? Because we don't want an osmotic pressure or high osmotic pressure in the tissue fluids. And if we leave these escape plasma proteins in the tissue fluid, can you see that's going to make the tissue fluid more osmotic? So it's going to blow it up. It's going to increase the volume of the tissue fluid. And we don't want that. So can you see we need to get rid of three litres of excess fluid a day? And also we need to get rid of any escaped plasma proteins because they're going to mess up the whole osmotic balance between the blood and between the tissue fluid. So we really need a drainage system here. Unfortunately we've got one. And that drainage system is the lymphatic system. So we have a lymphatic system to drain the excess tissue fluid and to get rid of the escape plasma proteins. Now, the blood capillaries are open at the arterial end to let the blood in and they're open at the venous end to let the blood out. They're open-ended capillaries. But the lymphatic capillaries aren't, they are closed-ended <coughs> capillaries. So the lymphatic vessels are a bit like your fingers. You go into the tissue spaces like that, but they're blind-ended. So what we have is blind-ended tubes, blind-ended capillaries. Now they're still made of specialised endothelial cells. The capillaries, they're only one cell thick, but they're blind-ended. So here's one cell here, and there's another one there, one there. So what we've got here is a blind-ended capillary. It's a lymphatic capillary sticking into the tissue spaces. And here we have another one. So these are blind-ended capillaries. And the thing about the lymphatic capillaries is whereas these cells are quite rigidly supported on a basement membrane, and these cells are quite, not completely, but fairly tightly packed together to form a fairly relatively well-formed rigid tube, the lymphatic capillaries are not. The cells in the lymphatic capillaries are a bit floppy. The cells can flop. So the cells can kind of flop open a bit like that. And when the cells flop open a bit, the excess tissue fluid and any escaped plasma proteins can get into the lymphatic vessel. 
So water and escape plasma proteins will get into the lymphatic vessel because of these fairly floppy cells. And because the lymphatic capillaries are blind-ended, can you see that once this material's in here, it can't go that way, because that's a dead end. So it's got to go down through the tube of the lymphatic capillary, away from the tissue spaces. So it's a drainage system for the tissue spaces. Can you see this means that tissues are incredibly more complicated than we might first have thought? We know that tissues contain cells, we know that they contain extracellular material, capillaries, the blood going through it. But as well as that, this is another superimposed complete circulatory system. The lymphatic system. Untold billions of lymphatic capillaries throughout the body, draining the tissue fluids. Millions of them. So if you think about your thumb, let's imagine, let's imagine this is your thumb here. your fingernail on there. Imagine, imagine that's your thumb. In a thumb, like other tissues, there's going to be untold millions of little lymphatic capillaries draining all areas of it. And these lymphatic drainage capillaries are going to drain into slightly larger vessels. And these slightly larger vessels are going to drain into larger ones still. So we've got another entire superimposed circulatory system. Just the difference is it's blind-ended capillaries. So the tissues of the body are full of lymphatic vessels, just the same as they're full of blood vessels. Incredible level of complexity required to drain the tissues. So this is draining away <coughs> escaped plasma proteins. It's draining away excess tissue fluid which has been formed. About three litres a day of excess tissue fluid which is not reabsorbed into the venous end of the capillary. But vitally, it's getting rid of the plasma proteins because they're going to mess our osmosis up. Then we'd end up with seriously soggy tissues. The patient would become very edematous. Now, when water is in here, it's part of the plasma. If that water goes through the wall of the capillary from the intravascular compartment into the interstitial compartment it's then called tissue fluid so in there a water molecule would be part of the plasma here the water molecule will be part of the tissue fluid once it goes through into a lymphatic vessel into a lymphatic capillary then it changes its name to lymph so the fluid that collects in here is called lymph. Or lymphatic fluid. So it's plasma there, it's tissue fluid there, it's lymphatic fluid once it's in the capillaries of the lymphatic system.
So this is actually pretty good because it's draining away the excess tissue fluid and it's draining away the plasma proteins. So really it's quite impressive, isn't it? It's keeping the tissues with just the right amount of water, with just the right amount of proteins. But from time to time, there's an additional problem. From time to time, bacteria can get into the tissues. So you might inhale some bacteria into your lungs. Or some viruses, in fact. Or some viruses might get into your gastrointestinal tract. Or you might prick yourself on a, a thorn and get an infection in your finger. So from time to time, infection gets in. This means we can end up with bacteria in the tissue spaces. I guess we could define infection as the presence of microorganisms in the body tissues. In this case, it's a bacterial infection because we've cut a finger when we've been gardening. And some bacteria have got into the tissue spaces. Do you normally have any bacteria in the tissue spaces? No? None at all? I've got that friendly bacteria like you get an acton on. Uh, you have. <laughs> you have in the lumen of the gastrointestinal tract. Oh, right, but in the actual tissues of the body, they are supposed to be sterile. So the body tissues are supposed to be sterile. Not supposed to be any bacteria there at all. But can you see now some have got in because we've broken the integument of the skin. In other words, we've cut ourselves. Bacteria have got in. And bacteria are quite like it in here because it's warm and there's some sugar in the tissue fluids for them to eat and there's a habitat for them to live in. But it, what it means is we now have an infection. So do we want these bacteria in the tissues? No. Actually, it's just occurred to me. If there's bacteria in the tissues, can you see there's a risk that some of these bacteria could get into the bloodstream? Heck, if they got into the bloodstream from your finger, can you see they could go absolutely everywhere, couldn't they? That would be really bad news, wouldn't it? We don't want that. We certainly don't want infection in the bloodstream. Carb is septicemia, would it? It would be a systemic, yeah, yeah, well, it, w it would be a bacteremia, it would be bacteria in the blood. We now recognise that that causes three levels of problem. The first is called sepsis, the second is called severe sepsis, and the third is called septic shock. They all sound pretty bad, actually, don't they? You fancy being septic? You fancy being septic? Mm. You fancy severe sepsis? That'd be even worse, wouldn't it? Let alone septic shock. So can you see we really don't want the bacteria getting into the blood. Now fortunately, the bacteria don't migrate through the wall of the capillary easily. But if the bacteria are left to hang around, what these bacteria do is they produce toxins. The bacteria produce toxins. And over time, those toxins would damage the walls of the capillaries. And that would let bacteria into the blood, and then they could go all around the body, causing a systemic sepsis. We don't want that. That would be seriously bad news. In fact, I don't really want these bacteria hanging around. In fact, I don't want these bacteria at all. You see, they're nothing but trouble. <coughs> they're infection. They could kill us, couldn't they? Potentially. So we don't want to leave the bacteria hanging around in the tissues. But fortunately, the walls of the lymphatic vessels are floppy. The walls of the blood capillaries are not floppy, so the bacteria can't flop in easily. But the wall of the lymphatic vessels are floppy, so that means because the cells are floppy, they can flop open 
and when the cell flops open you can see the bacteria can get in. So as well as draining the excess tissue fluid, as well as draining the plasma proteins that might escape, these lymphatics are actually quite good because bacteria can get into them, can migrate into them because these cells are floppy. But once the cells have flopped, they're not going to flop the other way. They're not going to flop out the way. So once the bacteria are in, they're stuck. The lymphatic drainage capillaries allow bacteria to flop in, but they don't allow bacteria to flop out. That means if there's bacterial infection in the tissue spaces, the bacteria will go from the tissue spaces into the lymphatic capillaries. And which way does the drainage of the lymphatic capillaries flow? Does it flow up that way? No, because it's a dead end. It flows down that way away, doesn't it? So can you see it's draining the bacteria away from the tissue spaces and away from the blood capillaries because we really don't want this infection to get into the blood. It's quite good really. And in the case of your thumb, if we had an infection in our thumb, suppose we had a nail infection or something, that's quite common. Instead of the bacteria getting into the blood, can you see these bacteria will be drained away in the lymphatic flow, draining the lymphatic fluid away from away from the uh, from the infected tissue. And these vessels, for reasons we'll see in a minute, that are draining the fluid away from the infection, if there is an infection, of course they're there all the time, draining proteins and fluid. They're called afferent lymphatic vessels. So these are all afferent lymphatic vessels, in this case draining your thumb. So that's a little afferent lymphatic vessel, that's a bigger afferent lymphatic vessel. So good for removing tissue fluid, good for remaining excessive, good for removing excessive proteins, good for removing infections, bacterial and viral infections. Mm. Where does it drain to? Ah, that's a very good question. We'll come on to that. The, the answer at the moment is it drains it down the afferent lymphatic vessel away from the tissue. Good question. Yeah. Uh, what happens like Jim, something like lymphoma then? Uh, lymphoma is a malignancy that involves cells that live in the lymphatic system. So in the lymphatic system, cells live called, surprisingly enough, lymphocytes. So lymphocytes live in the lymphatic system. And if some of particular types of those cells become malignant, if they become cancer cells, then that is a lymphoma. So it's a malignancy associated with lymphatic tissue because it's a malignancy of cells that live in the lymphatic system. But now you mention it, can ordinary tissue cells become malignant? Could this cell become malignant? Potentially, yes, it could, couldn't it? So cells, cancer cells, sorry, ordinary cells, tissue cells can become malignant. So, for example, you could develop a tumour inside the bronchial passages, a bronchogenic carcinoma. They're quite common, unfortunately. Or you could develop a tumour inside the colon, 
gastrointestinal tract tumour, a colon tumour. So it's possible that cells can become malignant. And bacteria, of course, the reason bacteria cause infection is because they divide, don't they? One bacteria becomes two. It's like rabbits, two becomes four, four becomes eight. And in fact, bacteria can divide every 20 minutes or every half an hour. So actually, if we didn't drain these bacterial cells out pretty quick, the infection can multiply really quite quickly. Infections can multiply quickly. And in the same way, what cancer cells do, if this cells become cancerous, what cancer cells do is they divide. One cancer cell becomes two, two becomes four, four becomes eight. And before you know it, you've got a huge cluster of malignant cells, a huge lump of them. What would we call a huge lump of malignant cells? Do we want tumours? No. Really bad idea, isn't it? So, if a cell becomes, when a cell becomes malignant, I don't know if you know, but normally cells stick together. So any two tissue cells will stick together. Cells express what is called adhesion molecules. They stick together. But when cells become malignant, they don't stick together properly. Because cancer cells are rogue cells. They do not obey the rules. So can you see, if you've got a cell, two normal cells, they'll stick together, making the tissue stick together, which is good. But if cells become malignant, very often they don't stick together. And if they don't stick together, can you see one cell can just float away? Does that make sense? It can just float away. So cancer cells are often no longer well fixed in the tissues. So what we really need if we want to get rid of this cancer cell, is some vessel with a floppy wall, which will let the cancer cell flop in, wash it away, and get rid of it from the tissue, isn't it? That'd be a good idea? Good idea, wouldn't it? Yeah. Perfect. Actually, that's exactly what we've got, isn't it? Come to think of it. You see, that's exactly what we've got. We've got drainage vessels with floppy walls, these cancer cells will float away, so cancer cells can flop into the lymphatics and be washed away in the lymphatic flow, meaning the cancer cell is not left hanging around in the tissue, meaning hopefully it won't divide, meaning hopefully we won't get a tumour. So even though the tissue cells are quite thick, they still fit through? Yeah, they do, they do, they do fit through. The, the, the cells are very floppy and very elastic, and they will fit through. Yeah. So you can see the lymphatics are seriously useful because they drain excess lymphatic fluid, they drain excess ex escape protein so we don't get the osmo osmosis, osmosis all mixed up. They're going to drain away viral and bacterial infections and they're going to drain away cancer cells. Sounds good to me. John? Yeah. So, so that, like, cause we have like a cancer cell yeah. and, and our lymphatic system get rid of it so mm. we don't develop cancer. So that, could, that yeah. towards, could that be happening to us right now? It could be, yeah. In fact, a lot of people think that we might get cancer quite commonly. Maybe, maybe you get cancer every day. But God willing, you won't get that disease because your immune system mops it up. By that, by doing that. But by this and other mechanisms, yes. So it may well be that the people who actually get cancer, it's not so much that they've got cancer, but their immune system has failed to get rid of it. So could a, a cause of like cancer and tumour be that your yeah, lymphatic system isn't working properly? Certainly that your immunological system wasn't working properly, yes. And this is part of your immune surveillance system. Um, yes. Yes. Um, mm. Can you test the function of your lymphatic system? If it's not working, you'll become puffy. You'll get an area of edema. So as long as you haven't got an edematous area, it's working properly. So if you compare the two halves of the body, if you compare one ankle with the other, and they're both equally slim, and you haven't got one that's edematous and one that's not, then it's reasonable to infer that your, immune, your lymphatic system is draining adequately and it's normal. Yeah, yeah good so question. Do you know when you say check your lungs for breath? 
Yep. Yeah. Like yeah, that's the next bit. We're going to we're, we're going to come on to that. Yeah. When you're testing for lymph lymph adenopathy associated with tumours. Yeah. We'll come on to that one. I'm going to pause there and let you have a chat about that. Is that okay? Tell your next door neighbour about that bit.